Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on the role of the church in the community. I hope you have lots of good ideas about how to do that. This particular lesson is part two of a two-part series, Justice and Mercy in the Old Testament. So we're going to try to learn some things from the Old Testament about how God feels about the poor, the needy, and so forth. We started that last week, and so we're going to continue it this week. I hope you have your Bible handy. We're going to look at a number of Bible passages, but let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we bow before you now in humble acknowledgement of the fact that these challenges that you've put before us are, are huge. It's really hard to know in our society, in our setting, in our day, exactly how we should go about some of these suggestions that you have made from Old Testament times. We know that things were different back then, but give us insights, help us to understand how we might apply these principles in our day as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. What do you think would happen if every Christian or even just every Seventh-day Adventist made it his or her challenge to reach out to the community around him or her? How? In what way? Yeah, what makes in, all the ways, in all the ways out. that are suggested by the Bible. Well, it's more than you need to be way. more specific than that <laughs> because it's just general to me. Okay. I can well, remember being in Sabbath school in like fifth, seventh, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, and we were told, everybody bring one of your non-Adventist friends to Sabbath school next week. I was the only one that had new people that weren't Adventists. I lived in Redlands, mm -hmm. and I had some really good friends that were not Adventists, but everybody else in, in there, they didn't know a single non-Adventist. Wow. Well, here's a suggestion in our Bible study guide. A neighborhood that had flourished in the 50s and early 60s had become like a war zone in the late 60s and early 70s. The majority of the families moved away, leaving behind a trail of abandoned, run-down, burned-out tenements. Businesses moved out and drugs and crime moved in, further making the neighborhood very undesirable. In 1986, a Christian family left their comfortable home in suburbia and moved into this depressed urban community. A pastor from another city joined them. They rebuilt two burned out buildings and made them their homes. The two families spent time in the streets meeting with community groups and mingling with those who remained in the area. These two families were the catalysts that God used to bring a church that brought healing, to begin a church that brought healing and transformation to this dead community. Their work and impact continues today, having made a big difference in many lives there. So Gary? You wanted an example? So, what if I don't feel like doing that? Am, am I, is this <laughs> you you said to me? me a little while ago, well, how you feel, whether you feel like it or not, doesn't matter. There's the problem right there. <laughs> you need to change the way you feel, Gary. Change well, okay. Attitude, yeah. <laughs> you don't notice any of the rest of us jumping over this. This is, this is talking about you here. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll stand up and I'll watch you guys do it first and I'll follow you guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, what it's would it be? It's a gutsy thing to do something like that. Yeah, well, I need some help because there's some, I mean, I don't even have any good ideas for doing that. Even if we all did that, would we be able to eliminate poverty? No. Jesus said very clearly in Matthew 26, the poor you're going to have with you always. But you might make a difference in a number of people's yes. lives. Here's one of the things that I, that I really been thinking a lot about um, homeless people and you know we're feeding down there at the station and we're doing all of these things and I have some friends who say well you know these are are you ever making a difference in people's lives and I started trying to look at some of the um, the examples in the Bible about some of these things and I I started thinking about the, the parable of the, um, the man who went out and sowed the seed, mm -hmm. and when there were the tares and the wheat growing side by side, he said, don't tear out the tares, you'll disturb the wheat. 
and let them grow together and then we'll take care of it. And it just seems like to, um, to try to pull people out and make some of those judgments until you really know it's, yeah. it's premature. Mm -hmm. And then you're in it for the results. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, you do need some feedback that what you're doing has some value, but disinterested benevolence, you're, you're doing it because that's what God would do, you know. We heard this would saying we? that he would have died for one soul. Well, look at all the ones that he didn't mm -hmm. say. <laughs> Uh, and you could look at it that way too. If you're, if you're just helping, if you just find one person, then wouldn't it be worth it in the eyes of God? Yeah. And and we are making a difference in a few lives, but there are some that probably, at, at least at this point yeah. in time, have no desire to make any kinds of changes. Yeah. So the poverty problem is going to go away, right? No. No. Not on this earth. Well, well, but you can make it go away for one person here. For one some, there. for some people, uh, for whatever reason, with misfortune and ill happenstance and bad choices happen to us. Just because I'm not in poverty doesn't mean something's not going to happen to my offspring for whatever reason, bad choices mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. um, so. Well, when you say poverty isn't going to go away, you're talking about the phenomena of poverty. Mm -hmm. You're not talking about the ability to remedy poverty in individuals' lives. Yeah. Well, there's a very interesting passage in the Scriptures, in Ezekiel 37, that um, our lesson suggests that might apply in this case. Let's look at this. Ezekiel 37, I'm going to read verses 1 to 14. I felt the, and now remember, where is Ezekiel? When he's, when he's giving this, he's receiving this message and he's writing it down? Yeah. He's some way, not too far from Babylon, he's in captivity. Basically the, the northern kingdom has disappeared into history, you don't even know what the Assyrians did with them, we don't know where they are. The southern kingdom of Judah has, is now in Babylonian captivity and he's speaking to a bunch of Jews who are in captivity. He says, I felt the powerful presence of the Lord and his spirit took me and set me down in a valley where the ground was covered with bones. He led me all around the valley and I could see that there were very many bones and that they were very dry. He said to me, mortal man, can these bones come back to life? I replied, sovereign Lord, only you can answer that. He said, prophesy to the bones. I mean, think about this. How practical does that sound? Prophesy to the bones. Tell these dry bones to listen to the word of the Lord. Tell them that I, the sovereign Lord, am saying to them, I'm going to put breath into you and bring you back to life. I will give you sinews and muscles and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and bring you back to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I, has been told, as I had been told. While I was speaking, I heard a rattling noise, and the bones began to join together. While I was watching, the bones were covered with sinews and muscles and then with skin, but there was no breath in the bones. God said to me, mortal man, prophesy to the wind. Tell the wind that the sovereign Lord commands it to come from every direction to breathe into these dead bodies and bring them back to life. So I prophesied, and as I had been told, breath entered the bodies, and they came to life and stood up. There, were, there was enough of them to form an army. God said to me, mortal man, the people of Israel are like these bones. They say that they are dried up without any hope and with no future. So prophesy to my people Israel and tell them that I, the sovereign Lord, am going to open their graves. I'm going to take them out and bring them back to the land of Israel. Um, and they will know that I am the Lord. I will put my breath in them, bring them back to life, and let them live in their own land. Then they will know that I am the Lord. I have promised that I will do this, and I will. I, the Lord, have spoken. I've been reading quite a few of the minor prophets lately, and that's the big theme of mm -hmm. many of those minor prophets. And uh, the question has crossed my mind is, uh, you know, that never seemed to have happened. It didn't happen. 
all oh, these, all mean, these prophets and messiah are going to do this, do that, and then I'm going to do this, and and even though you've been bad, I'm going to you. I'm faithful, and hasn't happened. I mean, well, that's sort of what back. it appears. They could ba get back to Jerusalem. It was a smaller number. A very a much smaller number. Well, yeah, I know, but there was there's one. Well, I mean, is it Zechariah or mm -hmm. or, or uh, uh, there were several. I can't remember which yeah. one I was been reading this week, and it was you know, basically it was saying everybody, the entire world is going to come and be yep. at your feet, and Zechariah. I'm going to be I'm going to be the Lord, and I'm going to. They're all going to worship me, and and Jerusalem's going to be it, and you're going to be it, and. Here's a question We're from Mark. Here, here's an answer, possible answer to your conundrum. In our right, in our lesson, Ephesians 2:10. Now we're jumping over to the New Testament, and I quote: "God has made us what we are, and in our union with Christ Jesus, He has created us for a life of good deeds, which He has already prepared for us to do. So the reason those bones aren't coming back to life is because you're not doing your good deeds. <laughs> it's all on you, Jay." <laughs> They're all in trouble, I guess. <laughs> well, well, when when the the prophets prophesied to the bones, mm -hmm. what is actually happening there? It's a metaphor, that's for sure. Yeah. But what do you think is happening there? Is it is it just a prophet speaking like to the people? Is that is that what is kind well, of well? Again, remember saying? the setting. The people felt like they were as good as dead. Ezekiel is speaking to a bunch of people who are working as slaves, prisoners in a foreign land, and as far as they know, they're never going to get, and in fact, most, very few of them ever did get back to the land of Judah. So when he prophesies, sighs, he, um, he tells them something, he tells the, the, the promise, the, the good news, the, the, mm -hmm. the fact that they're going to rise again and, mm -hmm. and have all that happen as mm -hmm. as the metaphor here says. Yeah. It'll happen to them. Yeah. Well, here's comments that our lesson includes from the writings of Ellen White. Our acceptance with God is sure only through his beloved Son, and good works are but the result of the working of his sin pardoning love. They are no credit to us, and we have nothing according to us, accorded to us for our good works by which we may claim a part in the salvation of our souls. Salvation is God's free gift to the believer, given to him for Christ's sake alone. The troubled soul may find peace through faith in Christ, and his peace will be in proportion to his faith and trust. He cannot present his good works as a plea for the salvation of his soul. But our good works of no real value is a sinner who commits sin every day with impunity, regarded of God with the same favor as the one who through faith in Christ tries to work in his integrity? The scripture answers, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them, Ephesians 2.10. In his divine arrangement, through his unmerited favor, the Lord has ordained that good works shall be rewarded. We are accepted through Christ's merit alone, and the acts of mercy, the deeds of charity which we perform, are the fruits of faith. Selected Messages, Book 3, pages 199 to 200. So, what does that tell us? It says you should do this just naturally because Jesus has created you for this, right? When I look around at what good people do and don't do, I just think that there is a really wide range of things that people can do to be kind and helpful and supportive and encouraging and all of that. And I, I think that different people have different gifts. Not all yeah. of us want to move into the, the, the ghetto area and um, yeah. you know, try to reform it. Well, and just because it's natural, we use the word natural, that doesn't mean, well, it can be perfectly natural for you to undertake this and still have to discipline yourself, still have to plan, still have to focus, still have to make determination, still have to make yourself get out of bed mm -hmm. 
to do these things. Just because you're doing that doesn't mean it's not a natural inclination. Use the word natural to think it just flows out <laughs> like a fountain, you know. And well, it says at the beginning of that that your acceptance from God comes from Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we're, we're without him, we can do all that stuff. No. Uh, that's, that's the key right there. So, so here's, here's the question. One of the statements we read there, and I quote again, salvation is God's free gift to the believer. So does that mean that our main task could be encouraging people to be believers? How do we do that? Well, even the devils believe, though. <laughs> True. Well, that I means didn't. everybody's going to be a believer, whether they live or die. Good point, Gary. <laughs> now, what do All we right. do with that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now we're stuck. Well, by the demonstration <laughs> of Christ in us, you know, he's, it's not me, it's Christ in me doing these things and the uh, responding to the needs set before me and uh, like in the parable where uh, the man has somebody come at midnight and he has no bread and so he goes to his neighbor and he says I, I need something to give to my this person who's come and, and he knocks and knocks and and, uh, and that's kind of the way it is. We, people have needs and we, we don't know how to, we don't have anything to give. So we come to Jesus and, and he gives us whatever it is. And that might be a, an immediate thing or it might mean we go to school to learn how to meet those mm -hmm. particular needs yeah. or, or whatever. What do you do with people that don't want to learn? It's, it, it, it's impossible. The whole Gospel of John, he wrote that Gospel at the end of, toward the end of the first century so that people would believe. Mm -hmm. If you go through the, the number of times you underline the word believe, 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 all the way through it. And uh, that has to work on your mind. And the salvation, that's healing. It's mm -hmm. to heal your mind. It's to heal how you think about God. But if people are, have other priorities, you can't force it on them. Well, what does it mean to be, in another passage from that quotation, accepted through Christ's merits alone? Well, Christ's merits is kind of your goal, isn't it? It's what you look at mm -hmm. to, to judge the standard of your life. So, He is the standard that you look to. And okay. He's the only one that you do look to. You know that that's a puzzling phrase it, it's almost as if <clears throat> you have to meet a certain standard and you can't meet that standard it's almost as if you have to accomplish something through works but you can't accomplish something through works but Jesus has worked it so therefore somehow through the his works you get the entitlement and there's something about that that doesn't ring quite right to me. I, I, I think I it's talking about... I don't about understand. That. I'm sure the words are there, but I don't understand exactly what, how that... I don't like the idea that he's worked something out, so now I'm... Well, if, if, if Christ worked it out and we don't have to do anything at all, then everybody should be saved. So obviously we have to do something a lot of people don't like that but we have to do something well they say you have to believe well that's something uh, well, I and think, that can be hard mm -hmm. well it says accepted through Christ's merits alone well what accepted what I, I think we're ex uh, there's a sense in which if we all got what we deserved we'd be dead mm -hmm. uh, so being accepted means that we have life and that we can uh, come <coughs> boldly before the throne of grace to find help in time of need. So we're accepted by, uh, not because we're worthy to come to God. In fact, we would be killed by His His, his glory if we beheld it uh, in its full measure. Yeah. What What is it that Jesus did that qualified for these merits instead of demerits? Well, he, was, he was God, that's <clears throat> what it was. <laughs> Abandon yeah, the idea of thing. merits, it just doesn't compute. God was, yeah, Jesus and God was a teacher. And if you don't want to spend the time to learn, 
But his merits, well, well, it seems to be the wrong his, word. It his is. merits are what we look at. I mean, if well, he didn't do anything, well, then how would we learn anything? Well, let, 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 let's talk about merits and the background of that. The, there are large Christian groups who teach that when we come up in the judgment, God balances our bad deeds with our good deeds. See? And if you have more good deeds than bad deeds, you're saved. If you have more bad deeds than good deeds, you're lost. And so um, the idea here is that Jesus was, not, was pure goodness. So he has lots of extra merits. So if you believe on him, he comes and puts a little extra good on your scale so that you have a better chance of... Look, Christ isn't a salt shaker. He's a, <laughs> he's a guy to look at. He's yeah. a guy to look at. He's the example to look at. Okay, like then let me... offsets? <laughs> Do we, what? Jesus says eternal life is to know the Father and the Son. Yeah. And he says, I have accomplished the work you gave me to do. I have made known your character. You've mm -hmm. seen me, you've seen the Father. That's Jesus saying that. Jesus. So, go, go ahead. ahead and finish. Go ahead. Uh, Jesus said of the little ones, their, their holy angels do continually behold the face of the Father which is in heaven. And I mm -hmm. think that's the state of the unfallen, that they continually behold the face of the Father. And when Adam and Eve, uh, resisted and and their wills became broken they could no longer behold the face mm -hmm. of the father or it would have killed them the resistance of their wills so part of the process is is to soften that will so that once again we can behold the face of the father and that's where Jesus becomes the light of the uh, we see the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. and then uh, by beholding, we become changed from one degree of glory to the next. But it's more about softening our wills so that we can abide in, in the holy presence of God. Well, so let me listen to these words. <clears throat> Do we need to learn from the life and death of Jesus so that our behaviors become more and more like his? Mm -hmm. Is that what is implied by Matthew 5, 43 to 48, where it says, you know, it challenges us, challenges us to be perfect as God is perfect? I don't think any of us can ever be that perfect, but I think that we can... So Jesus is telling us something that's impossible. I, I think mm -hmm. that... No, he isn't telling us to be perfect. He's telling that's us That's what to, it says. No, it sounds to me like it's to approach it. Approach it. Always okay. walk towards it. Okay. Don't just think that you're going to make it there and then you're, you the, got it. In the context, he's talking about being consistent. You know, you treat uh, you, the ones you love good, you treat the ones you don't like bad, but God sends his reign on the just and the unjust. So he, mm -hmm. is, he is the same to everyone. He, he reaches out, and I think that's what he's talking about with perfection. Yeah. Isn't it like, like it, is it... Until I was not a great math student, but was it a parabola that always gets closer and closer, but the points never touch? Mm -hmm. I I think that that might be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, well, we, Ellen White uses a little bit of a phrase. She says something like, "We're to be as perfect in our sphere as God is perfect in His sphere." Mm -hmm. Now, I hear some equivocation in that kind of a statement, but at the same time, I don't quite understand it all. But mm -hmm. But, okay. Uh, well, if you were what my sphere is, but if you were perfect as God, you would be God. That's that's how I look at it. And we're not and, God. And, and we and never and will be God. Yeah. And we're always approaching Him, it, His likeness. In the right and direction. That's right. You're I mean, abandoned the, the other direction. That's or you've repented, so you're going the right direction. Yeah. Well, remember, we're supposed to be getting ideas from the Old Testament. So I'm going to take you back now <laughs> to Ezekiel 47, not 37, 47. The man, and, and it talks about doing something around the temple in Jerusalem. Now remember, the temple in Jerusalem is in ruins at this point in time. It's, it's non-existent. This is Ezekiel stuff. Is that in the lesson or is this some stuff you've added? No, this is in the lesson. <laughs> what do you mean, <laughs> stuff I added? <laughs> Haven't you heard it before? <laughs> okay. This Ezekiel stuff sounds kind of... <laughs> we okay. usually go to Ezekiel for The that. man... Now, this is Ezekiel in vision. The man led me back to the entrance of the temple. 
Water was flowing out from under the entrance and flowing east, the direction the temple faced. It was flowing down from under the south part of the temple, past the south side of the altar. The man then took me out of the temple area by way of the north gate and led me round to the gate that faces east. A small stream, now the east is the side of the Mount of Olives, the east is on the side of Jericho and the Dead Sea and the Jordan Valley. Okay, A small stream was flowing out at the south side of the gate. With his measuring rod, the man measured 500 meters downstream to the east and told me to wade through the stream there. The water came on to my ankles. Then he measured another 500 meters and the water came up to my knees. Another 500 meters further down, the water was up to my waist. He measured 500 meters more and the other stream was so deep that I could not wade through it. It was too deep to cross except by swimming. He said to me, mortal man, note all this carefully. Then the man took me back to the bank of the river, and what I, when I got there, I saw that there were very many trees on each bank. Um, well, he said to me, this water flows through the land to the east and down to the river valley, Jordan Valley and to the Dead Sea. When it flows into the Dead Sea, it replaces the salt water of that sea with fresh water. Wherever the stream flows, there will be all kinds of animals and fish. The stream will make the water of the Dead Sea fresh, and wherever it flows, it will bring life. From the springs of Engedi all the way to the springs of Enegleam, there will be fishermen on the shore of the sea, and they will spread out their nets there to dry and so forth. For those of you who have been somewhere near the Dead Sea, as I was a couple years ago, there is nothing living in the Dead Sea at this point in time. So this would be a real transformation. Was it supposed to be that way? Well, I mean, it was supposed to literally get to be that way? And well, it's just a prophecy that wasn't fulfilled because there were conditions to the prophecy. And, well, here's, here's and then my next question is, mm -hmm. why was it supposed to be that way? I thought we we're supposed to be trying to get back to heaven, not over there by the Dead Sea. Why are we yeah. going to try and make all of this? Or is this symbolic of salvation? Well, that's the question. What is this supposed to mean? Uh, in actual fact, the, bo the bottom story, the Dead Sea is at the lowest point that you can, get, you can go to other than in the ocean. It's a, more than a thousand feet below sea level. And it's getting lower and lower because the water in the Dead Sea is going down and down. Um, but it's, it's like that because it's at the bottom of the Rift Valley. So every constantly, those two continental plates are moving apart and that part of the country is sinking all the way. It runs from, from Turkey all the way down to Israel and across all the way down into East Africa. And it's gradually moving apart. Those two plates are gradually moving apart and that area is gradually sinking. Did God plan it that way? Well, no human being ever <laughs> planned it that way, that's for sure. So, you can draw your own conclusion. So, well, is, is, is this is what he suggested here? This is a... Uh, a metaphor or an analogy for salvation and so that's the answer to all those problems I had with all those small Old Testament books they're not talking about that's the problem with the Jews they're taking this literally and and it's not supposed to be literal it's all some metaphor or allegory or something like that well our lesson suggests that maybe this is a symbol for what's supposed to be God's church and it quotes first Peter 2 4 and 5 Come to the Lord, the living stone rejected by the people as worthless but chosen by God as valuable. Come as living stones and let yourselves be used in building the spiritual temple where you will serve as holy priests to offer spiritual and acceptable sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. Now that says we're supposed to be part of the temple. Does that mean, and if we go to Matthew 5, the first part of the Sermon on the Mount, we're supposed to be light and we're supposed to be yeast. So now is Dennis correct or is the author of the Sabbath School lesson correct? <laughs> well, I like what Dennis a, says. <laughs> well, one of the closest examples in our world today to the vision that Ezekiel saw is the Zambezi River in Africa. And I happen to have the privilege of living right in the middle of the Zambezi River for a period of time when I worked out there. It begins as a shallow brook springing from under a single tree. <clears throat> but when the heavy rains come and streams pour into it from both sides, it becomes a mighty river which cascades over Victoria Falls and on the, on the border of 
Zambia and Zimbabwe. It's one of the biggest waterfalls in the world. Could our church, and here's where we come, Jay, here's your question, could our church have that kind of an effect on our community? And they found this interesting quotation in our lesson study, guide from volume 7 of the Testimonies, page 171, paragraph 4. Our work has been presented to me as, in its beginning, a small, very small rivulet. So is that the beginning of a Zambezi River? Oh, well, that was, what, a hundred years ago? And so look how we're progressing. Mm -hmm. We're all over the world, all these hospitals Coaching and schools. 20 million members. Right. We're doing the Lord. We're, we're, we're right on target. Well, I'm, I'm going I'm to the, 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 make the challenge even greater for you. You're all familiar with the story of Jesus' return to the, his hometown of Nazareth. I'm going to read just a couple of verses from his speech while he was there. He, he, he quoted this from Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has chosen me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, announce that the time has come when the Lord will save his people. Okay? So, he's preaching this to the capacity crowd in the town of Nazareth. What did Jesus do for the poor? Fed. Well, he brought them good news, right? But it was not the type of good news they wanted. They wanted him to help them conquer the Romans. They wanted him to make them, to make them rich, eliminate poverty, feed them and clothe them without any effort on their part. Isn't that what they wanted? Mm -hmm. Are you talking about the poor? Yeah. The, well, the people in Nazareth. Oh, okay. They were, they were poor. They were pretty poor. <laughs> So what did Jesus mean when he said God had sent him to proclaim liberty to the captives, recover the sight of the blind, to set free the oppressed, and to announce the good amounts of time when the Lord will save his people? Well, you know what Jesus did next, don't you? He quoted two stories from the Old Testament in which, which God's mercy was poured out on Gentiles. And what was their immediate response? Stone, Stone him. him. Throw him over Stone the him. Well, throw, I'm sorry, yeah, throw them over the edge of a cliff. So what so, happens if this is what we're supposed to be doing, and when we do that, that which surrounds us gets better, but things around us aren't getting better, so what does that mean? You're not doing your job? Oh, now we're, <laughs> we're in trouble here. <laughs> this is... This is Loma Linda, and okay. we've been here a while, mm -hmm. Long time. and we're in kind of this little bubble. Yes. And not too far over here is a community that just keeps going down, down, down. There's murders. Right? They have 28 murders in the first three months of this year, and um, a great deal of um, bad stuff over there, and it just gets worse and worse. Now. That's where I work, so be careful. <clears throat> well, you're going to have to start working a little harder over there. <laughs> <laughs> so, is that... Well, let's, what, let's, what is that saying about us? Well, <coughs> let's, let's put our stories together now. We had the story of Ezekiel in 47. You're not answering my question. Well, I'm going to try. <laughs> we have the story of Jesus here in, in, in Luke 4, and now we come to Revelation 22. The angel also showed me the river of the water of life sparkling like crystal and coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb and flowing down the middle of the city street. On each side of the river was the tree of life which bears fruit 12 times a year, once each month, and its leaves are for the healing of the nations. So what is that supposed to represent? Does that have any connection with Ezekiel's river? That didn't answer my question. Well, I'm <laughs> still trying. Give me a little chance here. Trying to stay on the air. That's what we're trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a prophet from the Old Testament that, that does this river thing, and we have a prophet from the New Testament that does the river thing. Does that. Is there any relationship between those two? And our lesson suggests that this is supposed to be a symbol of God's end-time church, and you're a member of that. So you're supposed to be light and salt and water for everyone around you. And everything's supposed to get 
real good, and when the end times come, there won't be any bad people chasing me. And you know, there's always the answer that if we weren't here, just think how bad it would be. That's another possibility. So, oh, yeah. That's a good one. I like that one. <laughs> I'm glad <laughs> to do that. <laughs> well, there's another <laughs> issue that, I, that I'm thinking of, and that is when I am being selfless, when I am contributing, when I am easing people's pain, whether it's physical pain, emotional pain, spiritual pain, mm -hmm. that some of, possibly the biggest um, impact will be on me even mm -hmm. more so than on the people that I'm trying to help or serve or I think sometimes we need to be doing these kinds of things for ourselves as much as for the people that need the services. So what, what, what you're saying there in a way is that we're interpreting this to mean <coughs> to the, in this case, to the nation of Israel or mm -hmm. to our community, but what you're saying is this could apply to the individual. This can be, could. This, mm -hmm. if, if you undertake this as an individual, all of this stuff is going to flow in you. All these benefits or... so or Well, the river is made up of all the rivulets. Exactly. And so each individual needs to step up and, and be part of it, you know. Mm -hmm. And when each of us is used by God in that way, then everything flows together. So what could we as a church, or maybe as a Sabbath school class, or as individuals, do to become a healing stream to the communities in which we live? That's our question for this quarter. Well, I we think need to know our community. Yeah, we need to, that's an individual question because each of us has different gifts and different situations. And does, does preaching the good news to the poor include reaching out to them in material ways? Because I say they're materialistic? Yes, and no. Well, because they need help. Okay. Well, Did Jesus do that? Well, well, Jesus was one of the poorest around. But uh, Judas was stealing from the purse that they used to give money to mm -hmm. the poor from. So he must have been contributing in some way if they had this purse. Yeah. Now, wait, wait a minute. We've wandered back into the tangible now here when we're talking about the spiritual. Both, I hope. Ethereal. Mm -hmm. okay. I really think it's both. So when I, I'm a carpenter, let's say, and I go out and uh, I put in my eight hours today, or maybe if I own my own company, I'm putting in a whole lot more time because mm -hmm. I have to do the taxes and all the book work after the evening and so forth. And in the end, I'm building nice homes for people to raise their families in. Mm -hmm. So I'm contributing to the fan, to the community in yeah. that way. And we interpret this as going out and healing the sick and raising the dead or something like that, all these wonderful platitudinous things, but aren't I already really qualifying for this just in my daily activities as I, I go about so. my... I hope so. You can be. Mm -hmm. So good, I don't need to... Well, yeah, let so me read stuff. a couple more passages. Yeah. It was philanthropic stuff. I, Isaiah 61, verse 9, there will be they will be famous among the nations. Everyone who sees them will know that they are a people whom I have blessed. Are we known as a people that God has blessed? Sure, and John said... the big said, cars I drive and yeah. fancy clothes I wear. And I see. Well, John picks up the theme, and this is what he says, and now I give you a new commandment, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. Are we as a church standing out like, I shouldn't say sore thumbs, are we, are we, are we, are we, are we a beacon of light. A beacon of light. Are we standing out like a beacon of light to the community? The there you go. Are we known as the real Christians? Well, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I like to lay out the challenge here, so I'm going to read something else. Here's Ellen White's words about why Jesus came. 
The law of Jehovah was burdened with needless exactions and traditions, and God was represented as severe, exacting, revengeful, and arbitrary. Think about that. He was pictured as one who could take pleasure in the sufferings of his creatures. We're talking about trying to relieve the suffering of his creatures. The very attributes that belong to the character of Satan, the evil one represented as belonging to the character of God. So if we correctly represent God, can we help to undo that problem? Jesus came to teach men of the Father to correctly represent him before the fallen children of earth. Angels could not fully portray the character of God, but Christ, who was a living impersonation of God, could not fail to accomplish the work. The only way, now look at this incredible statement, the only way in which he could set and keep men right was to make himself visible and familiar to their eyes. So we need to see Jesus somehow or other. Christ exalted the character of God in contrast to what Satan had said, attributing to him the praise the, and giving to him the credit of the whole purpose of his own mission on earth. The whole purpose of Christ's own mission on earth, that's what it seems to suggest, to set men right through the revelation of God. In Christ was arrayed before men the paternal grace and the matchless perfections of the Father. In his prayer, just before his crucifixion, he declared, I have manifested thy, th thy name, I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. When the object of his mission was attained, the revelation of God to the world, now this is the third time that she said that his work is to represent the Father to the world. The Son of God announced that his work was accomplished and that the character of the Father was made manifest to men. So now, if we reach out to the poor in various ways, including material ways, are we following the example of Jesus by correctly representing God to the community. Sometimes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> do, or do better sometimes than others. Okay, well, that makes you about like the rest of us. Huh? <laughs> well, if we accept Jesus' own words that, came to preach the, that he came to preach the gospel to the poor, and also accept these words from Ellen White that his main job was to represent the Father correctly, how are these two goals associated or related? Is that a stumper? No, it's just kind of hard to explain the way it's asked. Myra's awfully quiet over there. I'd like to hear her answer. <laughs> okay, just sit over there and hear it. <laughs> you know, I do, I do have a point, though, oh that good. is somewhat having children and remembering when I was a teenager and hearing my father say, oh, I wish we'd never let her listen to that music. <laughs> Jill Clark singing oh, yeah. Downtown mm -hmm. or something or other. I mean, it was nothing. It was just yeah. a little. And our young people today, there are a number of them that have left the church. And there's a few of them coming back because they like the music and they like the message that is presented with the music. It's not just the music. And I, I hear it amongst our group right here that uh, negative things to this and you have to balance but when you're in kindergarten you give them kindergarten mm -hmm. attention and these kids have gone back to that place where they had they can see God appreciates them for who they are mm -hmm. they have gone in all these different directions and they're coming back and if we say no you know you're not doing it my way mm -hmm. that's that would be a mistake for sure yeah well, you all are familiar with Micah 6 in the Old Testament, since we're supposed to be focusing on the Old Testament. Let me read just the key passages, Michael 6, Micah 6, 6 to 8. What shall I bring to the Lord, the God of heaven, when I come to worship him? Shall I bring the best calves to burn his offerings to him? Will the Lord be pleased if I bring him thousands of sheep or endless streams of olive oil? Shall I offer him my firstborn child to pay for my sins? No. The Lord has told us what is good. What it requires of us is this, to do what is just, that's another word for righteous, to show constant love, and to live in humble fellowship with our God. Okay? 
So how do we do what's just? How do we live with constant love? Well, I think it begins with the first one, the humbly living with, <laughs> with God. Mm -hmm. uh, because unless we are in His presence, He's the giver of all good gifts, so we don't have anything to give unless okay. it flows from Him. So uh, justice, you know, we, everyone, every man's way is right in his own eyes. So if we just do whatever we want to do, it's not, it's not going to be God's will. So, uh, and, and love, of course, he is love. So he's the only source. So it would flow from him also. What's another, what's another word for just? It's a righteous. Righteous. Right oh, my goodness, fair. that's a right pretty doing. powerful word there, just yeah. for just. What about fair, wasn't it? Well, <clears throat> fair, but justice, justice has taken on a legal sort of mm -hmm. implication in our time. It did not have that in, in ancient times. I, uh, my perception that God is, is very just. Mm -hmm. And when I think of that in relationship to me, I think he's fair. That, that's that's a word that I use. May it not might be well, the proper term, but when it comes to, but, but just a minute, Jay. Let's be care, <clears throat> careful here, because if God was really fair, none of us would be saved. None of us deserve to be saved. Yeah, why would you just say that? Mm -hmm. Huh? Well, the dead. reason why we're not saved is we're separated from. Doesn't work from with him. my word of my definition of fair. I think. But but I think I get that same feeling when I read that too. It's fairness. Just be fair with each other. Mm -hmm. You know, don't. Don't over, yeah. you know, don't cheat. Don't, you know, well, want to make sure yeah. that everything is. Here's, here's what our, yeah, Maybe justice and mercy, because mm -hmm. that's how God approaches mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Not just what we think of as justice, but blended with mercy. In, in, in commenting on, on Isaiah 58, verse 7, our Bible study, I mean, our Bible commentary, the Adventist Bible commentary says this, true religion is practical. To be sure, it includes the rites and ceremonies of the church, but it is, in the, it is in the life lived before one's fellows that the presence or absence of true religion is manifest. It is not so much a matter of abstaining from food as it is of sharing food with the hungry. Practical godliness is the only kind of religion recognized at the judgment bar of God, and of course it quotes Matthew 25. So what kind of practical godliness is possible in our day? You mentioned about the fast earlier on. Mm -hmm. It says in Isaiah 58, It is not the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the thongs of the, of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. It is not to spare bread with the hungry. Excuse me. It is not to share bread with the hungry. It, can, is it not, is what it meant to say. Mm -hmm. And bring the homeless poor into your house and so yeah. forth, okay? It's not you yourself going hungry for so many yeah. hours. That isn't the fast that God wants. So I don't see in this Micah 6, Six you know, keep, keep the Sabbath, you know, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Have a correct picture of God. Well, that was, no, that was a no. part of their whole religious picture here. But God says, that's not what really matters. What about going about your, your, your business today, your calling, mm -hmm. and caring about people and, and the world around you? Does that fit? Well, one of the sins of ancient Israel was barricading themselves off from everybody around them. Oh, we're not going to have anything to do with the Samaritans. We're not going to have anything to do with those well, pagans. Would, you look at the Old Testament. And you, that's, that's a lot of passages that lead you to believe that's what they were supposed to. Not supposed to mix and not supposed to no, no, do no, this. And, and well, you're not supposed, supposed to, to be a peculiar people and not be like everybody else. And How many Adventist communities have formed almost like little ghettos? So try to protect <laughs> ourselves from the community. Look around. Well, Christianity always comes down to the individual. We may act as a community, but we cannot demonstrate Christianity as a group 
unless we do so as individuals. So, there are many passages in the Bible that talk about being fair to our, in our dealings with others, especially the widows, orphans, and foreigners, and to be humble <coughs> and teachable. And I mention, I can think of Isaiah 1 and Isaiah 58, Hosea 6, 6, Amos 5, 21 to 24, 1 Samuel 15, 22, Psalm 51, 16, Proverbs 21, 3, Matthew 9, 13, 12, 7, I mean, we could go on and on. Could we, think about this now, could we become so caught up in our desire to meet the, 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 the physical needs of the poor that we forget their spiritual needs? Absolutely. Or could we do the other thing around? Could we so be so concerned about their spiritual needs we don't bother anything about their physical needs? Well, but Diane has mentioned that a little bit in her work down at the station. It seems to me like uh, these people come and they come for food, which is meeting their physical needs, and this is legitimate. It's a legitimate need. But she's finding it very difficult sometimes to to get any kind of a response to her her spiritual intimations. It's like these people have a wall and they're not interested in these <clears throat> kinds some, of things. Some so. are, some aren't. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I really think that um, that God is putting things in front of people all the time. Mm -hmm. And at some point in time, well, each and every day people are making decisions to accept or to just let it go or, you know, to fight against it even more um, strongly. But I think that he doesn't really give up on people. And mm -hmm. so to, um, you know, we, we have prayer, we do things, we reach out to um, you know, to the people who are there. As soon as, you know, food is served and things are settling down in that area, then people go and sit and talk and, and um, figure out where people are and, and if they're interested in making some kinds of changes or what, you know, just seeing what's going on with them. Mm -hmm. You know, what was, didn't Jesus tell his disciples, you know, go out and do this good work and if you're not received, then, you know, go on your way, dust your feet off and and be on your way. Maybe Diana will sell some of these people that are just coming for the food and not responding. It's time we dusted our feet off. You, you don't need to come anymore. <laughs> well, I start giving them little jobs. Can you take this over to the trash? Can you take this bag of trash over to the dumpster? Mm -hmm. So when that happens, do they stop coming? No. Oh. They say, oh, I'll be glad to do that. Most of them. Well, you know that um, Christians have had a lot of debate down through the centuries about mm -hmm. faith versus works. And some would say that's what we're talking about here. Is, that, is this faith versus works? Well, it depends what you think you're going to get out of the works, probably. If, um, if you just, if the works just proceed out of your, your spirit, you know, type of thing, that means there's something inside that's doing that. Okay. There. But I don't think we know, I, I, I'm not looking at people and going, wow, I must have helped them with those words today. Mm -mm. I, we don't know where that's stuck in there and it'll come out for somebody else mm -hmm. to see the, hopefully, the growth of a, our, our little feet. Often things come out that you, you're surprised that Exactly. That, that they even drew those conclusions from what you'd said in the third place or what you did. Yeah. We're, we're running out of time here, but, um, you know, we might say, well, we, we need to reach out to those who are depressed, those who are in despair, but don't we have professional people who are supposed to take care of that today? Does that mean we, the rest of us don't have any responsibilities in that area? Oh, you, you're, you're, de you're depressed? Go and see the psychiatrist. Sometimes people just need somebody around who will sit there and listen to them. And, mm -hmm. uh, we may not be, we may just be the holding pattern that they need before they can get professional ha help. Well, in, in, as we draw a conclusion, I'm going to read you a couple of verses. We've sort of hinted at these. 
Jesus said to the disciples, Matthew 25, I was hungry and you fed me, thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was, stranger, I was a stranger and you received me in your homes. Naked and you clothed me, I was sick and you took care of me, in prison and you visited me. And what do the disciples say? When did we do all that? And what was the response? To the extent that you've done it unto the least of these, my brother, and you've done it unto me. Okay. How do we do that? Can we do that in 2016? Be sensitive to the needs around us. Does that mean that theology and understanding the truth about God is relatively <laughs> unimportant? Well, what, you know, you don't have to be homeless and destitute to be needy. Mm -hmm. We all have yeah. needs. Well, do we, should we be out marching in the streets for social issues? Oh, I don't hope. I certainly hope not. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a there's a famous yeah, man. Oh yeah, not going there. <laughs> there's a famous <laughs> pastor, actually the son of a pastor by the name of Nar uh, Martin Niemuller, back before the Second World War, who said, first they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because it was I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came from me, and there was no one left to speak from me. How should we relate to those kind of comments? Does working for social justice, social issues, mean we are turning away from the gospel? Are we doing a good job of preaching the, uh, the gospel if we do that? How many members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church understand the really important theological issues as, such as why Jesus had to die? Do we, need to, do we need to somehow rather carry these messages to the poor? Well, I would suggest to you out there that Luke 4 is a puzzling passage. Did Jesus really proclaim liberty to the captives? Did he heal blind people? Yeah, he did a few times. Did he set at liberty those who are oppressed? Well, he left John the Baptist in a prison to be beheaded. He did proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus spoke these words very early in his ministry, and he, gave it to, he spoke them to his disciples to go out and follow his example. So now I would like to pass the baton over to you, our kind and wonderful Father. You've laid before us a tremendous challenge. What can we do in our situation to reach out to the poor, to the troubled, to the depressed, to the despairing, to the hungry? We believe that doing this might provide an opportunity for us to speak a word in season, out of season, about your love and your kindness, to represent you the best we can. May that be our experience is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.